Hello, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this Global Investigative Journalism Network Masterclass with reporter Dan McCrum, who will be talking about his investigation into a massive case of corporate fraud. My name is Catherine Eban. I'm a contributing editor with Vanity Fair magazine in New York. Um, I'm also the author of Bottle of Lies, the inside story of the generic drug boom. Um, Wirecard. Once a $30 billion global blue chip financial services and tech company, Germany's Wirecard filed for insolvency in 2021 in what is one of the biggest corporate frauds of the modern era. The tenacious and prolonged investigative reporting by the Financial Times uh, helped it to uncover this fraud, malpractice, and negligence. Dan McCrum, a senior Financial Times investigative journalist, first reported the story in April 2015 with a series called The House of Wirecard. He asked a simple question familiar to investigative journalists. Do the company's numbers add up? In today's masterclass, Dan will explain how he uncovered Wirecard's shady practices and faced up to both the firm's tactics to scare the Financial Times off the story and the response of relevant financial oversight bodies and others. He will share his tips and tools for investigating corporations. Without further delay, I'd now like to introduce today's guest speaker, Dan McCrum. Dan is on the Financial Times investigations team and has been reporting on business from New York and London for 15 years. His reporting has been recognized with more than a dozen awards and prizes, including Journalist of the Year at the 2020 British Press Awards and a special Deutsche Reporter Preis for investigative journalism. His first book, Money Men, which has just come out, uh, is the inside story of the astonishing rise and fall of the $30 billion German fintech Wirecard. Before we start, a little bit of information about the Global Investigative Journalism Network for those of you who are not familiar with it. GIJN is the largest global network of nonprofit investigative journalism organizations with 235 member organizations in 89 countries. But it works with journalists everywhere, in nonprofits, in commercial organizations, and with freelancers. It has an extensive range of resources and tip sheets to help journalists worth worldwide, which you can check on GIJN.org. Um, I will say that GIJN helped me extensively when I was reporting uh, my book on a global uh, generic drug fraud, Bottle of Lies. Anyway, we also want to hear from you in the audience, so please send written questions and messages in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can. You can start asking questions from now. When the speakers are finished, um, GIJN's Emily O'Sullivan will join us on screen to moderate the questions. And please note, we will be recording this session for posting later uh, <clears throat> on YouTube. So let's start. Um, Dan, uh, if you can uh, share your screen, uh, we're gonna begin your slide presentation and our discussion. Great, well, thank you very much for that um, kind introduction, Catherine. And let me just share the screen and hopefully you should be able to see that now. And um, yeah, so, and I think the idea today is to talk a little bit about this incredible, well, I won't say it's incredible, this investigation which took over my life and all these incredible things happened during it. And, um, and I want to try and sort of share some of the tips and tricks that I learned along the way. But first, let's just talk about the impact of the investigation, because that's really what we want to do as journalists, right? Let's start at the end. So Wirecard was a big tech company. It was worth almost $30 billion, as you said, at its peak. And the stories published in the Financial Times exposed that this was a huge fraud from top to bottom. Um, this prompted a lot of soul searching in Germany when uh, the company was exposed because it was one of Germany's largest companies at that point, a member of the DAX 30 index of listed companies. Um, so there was a full German parliamentary inquiry, which has pr prompted reforms of both the financial regulator, uh, the way corporate boards are structured, and also 
some reforms are coming along in terms of how accountants are regulated. Um, following the, uh, the collapse of Wirecard, uh, the large global accounting firm Ernst & Young, which was responsible for auditing Wirecard's books for a decade, has decided to split itself in two, separating audit from consulting, possibly anticipating some of the measures that may be coming down the track in different countries. Um, but you know, also I think as a consequence of its embarrassment of what happened in Wirecard. Um, criminal trials are set to start in September of the chief executive, Marcus Brown, who is on screen there in his black turtleneck and a couple of other executives. And um, there were several notable resignations following the stories, including the head of Germany's financial regulator, the head of its accountancy regulator, the head of EY Germany among them. And if you want the complete full story, I have written it in the book, which you kindly mentioned, Money Men. And um, what I try to do there as well is not just write a sanitized account of the journalism that was involved in the investigation, but also, as I'll come to, some of the mistakes we made along the way, hopefully so that uh, other people won't make the same ones. And the way I thought I'd talk about this today is to break sort of the investigation down into phases because it happened over a period of six years and at different times took over my life and there were moments when it went well and moments when it went badly. So let's start right back at the beginning, sort of as a way to explain what it is we're talking about, what this company Wirecard was. So in 2014, in the summer, I was working for a financial blog, which is part of the Financial Times FT Alphaville. And I had decided that the thing that I would focus on were short sellers, these sort of typically hedge fund managers in financial markets who look for companies which are overvalued. Either there's some problem there, they're up to no good, or their shares are simply overvalued. I thought they were interesting people. And I also thought these companies would be journalistically interesting. And the phrase that we always use at the FT is stories get stories. If you want to write something, write about something, writing stories in that subject area alerts everyone to the fact you're interested. And so because I'd written about a number of accounting frauds, um, people started to get in touch. And it was in one of these conversations with a short seller, um, a guy in Australia. He said to me, Dan, would you be interested in some German gangsters? So I said, yeah, of course, <laughs> who wouldn't be? And it turned out the company he was talking about was called Wirecard. And at that size, it was quite small and not very well known. It sort of presented itself as the European PayPal. It did something to do with payments, sort of helping businesses accept credit cards and debit cards. It was worth about 4 billion euros and its business was very hard to understand. And then I was approached by another short seller who came to me with a very interesting theory about it. But there were two competing theories about the company. One, which this short seller presented was that um, it was an accounting fraud. And the other was that Wirecard was essentially money laundering. The theory was that it had a hand in every sort of unpleasant bit of payments that you might, be, you might find online or helping every unpleasant business that you might find online take money from their customers. And so to begin with, I focused on the accounting fraud side. Let me, uh, let me jump in. Yeah, please do. And ask, um, <clears throat> what was it that caused, so you had two different short sellers, presumably in two different locations, one in Australia and yes. one where? Uh, one was in London. One was in London. So. What is it about the company and the company's business model that caught their attention? So um, the guy in Australia thought it was the money laundering side of things, but he thought there was some fraud as well. The guy in London came with a much more fully formed theory, and he thought it was accounting fraud. Because what he had done, and you know, I can talk about the numbers, mm -hmm. but there's a simpler way to think about it, which is... Um, what he had found was that the company seemed to be lying about things. 
Um, and there's a phrase which uh, short sellers use, uh, which is, there's never just one cockroach in the kitchen. And so what this company Wirecard had done was it had grown very quickly by buying up a lot of small businesses mm -hmm. all over Asia. And what the short seller had found was when he went and looked at sort of local business filings in places like Singapore and, you know, statements related to these deals in local media, they were very different to how it was presented by the parent company back in Germany. Mm -hmm. And that was the thing that went, aha, something's up here. So it was sort of the numbers didn't match up or the way they described it didn't really match up to what was what was happening on the ground in, um, in Asia. Mm -hmm. And there were other signs as well, for instance. Um, so Wirecard was buying these businesses. And when you went and got the local account filings, you could see that there were lots of warnings. They weren't in good shape. They weren't making any money. And in some cases, their auditors had issued what's known as a sort of a going concern warning that um, there was a danger that the company might go bust if it wasn't supported. And that was quite different to how Wirecard had presented these as, you know, highly profitable, thriving businesses. So you found these, uh, these initial two tips credible, presumably. Um, tell us a little bit, and I think this might be in your next slide, uh, about your first piece uh, on this. So what I did is I, I had to go and, so the way I work with uh, a lot of these short sellers is sort of as secret sources. They didn't want to be identified and they didn't want to stand up and say, I think there's a problem at the company. They would rather give me the information, let me make of it what I will, and then if I want to write a story. So I had to go and find the documents myself, you know, go to the local registries, pull them, and basically recreate the analysis that they had given me so mm -hmm. that the so that I could be comfortable publishing it. And there was a real challenge to writing this because what I was doing was looking on from the outside and trying to say, it looks like there's fraud happening at this company. But because in the UK, we have very restrictive libel laws, um, you can't just throw that fraud word around. So I had to try and write an article essentially drawing attention to this theory without explicitly saying this looks like a fraud. And so the way I wrote this was, um, it was a quite a long blog post called The House of Wirecard. And it framed the company as a puzzle. Did its numbers make sense? Why was it doing these strange things? And sort of, you know, phrasing it as, let's ask some questions about the company. Um. Okay, so you know, for those listening, you may recall um, an investigation into Enron uh, that began uh, in Fortune Magazine, which I used to write for, by Bethany McLean, who also, I believe, was tipped by short sellers. So certainly, Dan, we can conclude from this, do not ignore tips from short sellers uh, among the lessons to learn here. Absolutely, and I think, yes, I thought, you know, so, I mean, in broad terms, it was look for people who have an interest in, a, in the sort of stories that you want to see written. Short sellers want to see wrongdoing at companies exposed. And the other thing to think about is um, be aware of their motivations. So in financial journalism in particular, everyone you speak to has a motive. The chief executive has stock options. Investors usually want the share price to go up lawyers, accountants, they're all getting paid. And short sellers are no different. They just have motivations in a slightly different direction, but you have to treat them carefully, which I think, I think that brings us to our next slide, actually, yes. quite neatly. I was going to say in time, you would be accused of having your own, you would be falsely accused of having your own motivations, but, but let's go to the next, uh, the next slide. Yes. So, the mistake. So one of the things that was always unusual at Wirecard was every interaction with the company was a little bit strange. So normally large listed companies, 
behave in predictable ways. They hire very expensive PR consultants to represent them, and you sort of get used to dealing with them. Wirecard was a bit odd. So when I first started trying to talk to them and ask for an interview with the chief executive, they turned me down. So they were too busy, which is a bit strange for um, you know, a small tech company which usually wants publicity. And then when I sent them some detailed questions about their accounts, they came back and said, well, this is very suspicious. We were asked some similar questions by some nasty hedge funds recently. Are you in league with these guys? Are you naively being used by them? And that was like, aha, I think we've hit a nerve here. I think we're onto something. And what Wirecard had done in the past and would do again was whenever critics appeared, it would accuse them of basically just trying to manipulate its share price. Um, of, you know, so there was nothing to it. They were basically throwing mud to cause damage to the company rather than doing serious justified work. And so what happened in early 2016? So I had published my stories in 2015. They got a little bit of interest from, you know, accounting nerds, hedge funds, but hadn't really made a big impact. Then a new set of short sellers came along who decided to publish the story themselves anonymously. This is quite common in the US. It's known as a sort of short seller attack. Um, and people will put out a dossier of information which they say, look, there's something wrong in this company and here's all the information, hoping to drive the share price down. And this happened with Wirecard. Um, some guys published a report focused very much on the money laundering side of things. And they shared a copy of the report with me in advance. And I thought it was amazing. It was this sort of 100 page dossier, which finally seemed like, OK, this is the thing which is going to get to the heart of it and is going to force German regulators to investigate. But I also got a bit carried away. So I was determined to sort of own the story and be the first one to write about it. And I knew this report when it was published was circulating amongst market traders and people. So as far as I can, was concerned, it was out in the public domain. And I had made a mistake when they shared it with me because I had said I would look at it, but I wouldn't approach anyone for comment until it was published because they didn't want to tip off the company. Um, and so that meant that I couldn't really write anything useful about it because I hadn't really tested it properly, like you know, asking the people for their version of events. And so I wrote a very short blog post, which basically just drew attention to the fact that this short attack had been published and uh, with a link to the report. And the phrase we use at the FT is, if you ask the question, should we run this by the lawyer, then you already know the answer. Mm -hmm. Go and if there's any doubt whatsoever, go and ask the lawyer because we have this terrific uh, in-house lawyer, Nigel Hansen, who keeps us out of trouble. And with this one, because it was just, you know, a couple of sentences, and I assumed it was, you know, already circulating, just drawing attention to it. And um, it was pretty, people would recognize it as a short seller attack. It would be safe to just do a very simple blog post and no more. Not really much on the content, just you might want to read this. Um, and that was quite a big mistake because what Wirecard's lawyers, um, a London firm called Shillings, who are quite notorious, shall we say, in, their, in the success with their reputation defense work for lots of lovely people, um, started sending threatening letters to the FT, which basically said the Financial Times was responsible for publishing this entire report and so we were on the hook for everything written in it. Um, and so that would basically meant Wirecard could file a libel suit at any point it wanted for a whole year after that, which would get very expensive very quickly. So that would seem to be a, uh, <clears throat> a clear effort to chill any future reporting. Um, what, was the, what was the response of the FT to that? So, the FT, the FT sort of realized we were in 
I've made a bit of a mistake. I got a bit of a telling off, but not the editor Lionel Barber was actually quite good at good about it all because um, Alphavore had a slight reputation for pushing the envelope mm -hmm. that the blog I was writing for. Um, but what it meant was I couldn't write about anything in the report. So this hundred pages of allegations all about the company being involved in money laundering, I basically had to leave it alone hmm. because writing anything about it would have been sort of daring wire card to sue us. Mm -hmm. And so what that meant is I went from being the person who had written all about Wirecard, was one of the few people to take an interest in it. And because the Financial Times wasn't touching it, I think that helped chill other people writing about it and really investigating its contents. And so, so it was very effective use of lawyers by Wirecard, enabled by my mistake, to sort of chill you know, interest in the story. And the result was that, um, they, well, actually, there, there's an interesting example, and we can talk about editorial support here. Um, so I, I always had the backing of um, my editor on the team, Paul Murphy, and um, he worked with me on the entire investigation, and he's now the investigations editor at the FT. And that was very important, because actually there was a journalist at Reuters called Alistair Powell, who, decide, who got quite interested in Wirecard and decided to pick up the threads of the story and take a real look at it. And he wrote this amazing expose of uh, what I call a paperwork factory. Um, in a small town in, in the north of England, there was this corporate formations provider that was basically setting up hundreds and hundreds of companies which were being used by Wirecard to sort of send money through. Um, so like an online casino would set up in, I don't know, Curacao or somewhere. And then it would also have this little UK company and the money would come from Wirecard to the UK company and then onto the tax haven. And the people in supposedly in charge of these companies were just locals who had been found in a pub. They were paid 50 pounds to sign their name to it. And it had the whole look of they're trying to hide something here. Maybe it's money laundering. And so what As the Power wrote for Reuters was this incredible expose of the whole thing. Mm. And it got tremendous attention. It sort of led to the BBC all day here. People talked about it in Parliament and it really exposed weaknesses in the system of UK corporate regulation. But Alistair hadn't been commissioned to do it, I understand. And um, when it came to the crunch, under pres legal pressure from Reuters, under legal pressure from Wirecard, Reuters took Wirecard's name out of the story. So it was this sort of paperwork factory up in the north of England run by this young guy with four G GCSEs. I don't mean that disparagingly, that's how he describes it. Um, who was supposedly in charge of the whole thing. And there was no mention of this German bank which had orchestrated it. And again, so I think that's an example of both the effect that legal pressure can have and also not having editors who are going with you on the story and are prepared to back you in those key moments. Right. So clearly there is this chilling effect. The company is very skillfully using its lawyers. What happened next? How did you, how did you deal with that? Well, so... Um, I actually gave up for a bit. So this is, we're talking 2016. So by the tw start of 2017, um, I felt both theories had had a thorough airing. I'd written as much as I could. And the German financial regulator decided it was going to investigate the short sellers for market manipulation. And Wirecard's accounting firm, Ernst & Young, signed off on the accounts again, and the share price tripled. So I kind of thought, well, there are other stories which are easier to deal with out there. Mm -hmm. um, but then something very strange happened. So my editor, Paul Murphy, was at a lunch with one of his sources. And they started discussing Wirecard. And his source said, well, you know, there's real money on the table here. 
uh, I've heard $10 million mentioned. Go and talk to your friend Gary. Um, and so, and so what happened was there was maybe $10 million on offer to make these stories that I've written about Wirecard just go away. And I think this is very interesting because one, who can't you buy for $10 million? But as journalists, we then faced a question. Like, I mean, we joked about taking the money, but it was, was this a real bribe or was this a trap to try and prove that we were corrupt and discredit us? So what we did is we agreed to meet the guy who was running Wirecard's Dirty Tricks. He's actually on the wall behind me. His name's Jan Marslek. And he was sort of Wirecard's criminal mastermind. Um, he was the one who was sort of orchestrating all the pushback against critics of the company. And it would turn out was also the one who was putting all the frauds together. And so we arranged a lunch at a very expensive restaurant in London. And we decided that we would have to uh, film it and get a recording of it to try and catch him on tape offering the money and also to prove that we hadn't asked for a bribe. Um, and so to do that, we had to first sort of clear the public interest test. So we had to have a lot of serious discussions. Was subterfuge, you know, secret recordings justified in this case? Yes, there is serious criminality at issue here. Um, then we had to get used to the, to the technology. And uh, so this picture here on your screen was taken by uh, three of my colleagues who dressed up as sort of ladies who lunch. And they had a camera hidden in a handbag. And, um, and uh, Paul Murphy himself was wired for sound, and uh, we went and had the lunch. Extraordinary. Um, so was the offer that was made explicit? So Jan Maslick was clever enough never to directly make the offer himself. And so we were never able to say, yes, we have been offered this much money by Wirecard to make the stories go away. And what we think happened as well was um, the restaurant venue was switched at the last moment. And we think maybe our amateur surveillance efforts were probably caught by Wirecard's very expensive and professional surveillance efforts. Um, because as, as we started to realize they were employing um, a lot of private detectives. And we'd also become aware that um, there were attempts to hack into our email and also a lot of sort of journalists or hedge funds who are known to be critical of Wirecard were also receiving similar attacks to try and break into their systems at the time. So we started to suspect. So what this really did is it left us unable to tell a story because there was nothing concrete we could publish, but left us with the conviction that we were definitely dealing with a criminal company. I, I should say so. I mean, talk about an incentive to keep reporting. Uh, extraordinary, really. So what, what happened next? So as, as I'm sure you know, that you have this incredible moment as a journalist where sort of from a clear blue sky, suddenly a whistleblower appears. And the timing was quite important. So this was October 2018. Mm -hmm. And Wirecard had just entered the DAX index in Germany. So it had gone from being this small, obscure company nobody knew about to, you know, it was worth more than Germany's largest bank, Deutsche Bank. Um, and it had become an automatic investment for pension funds, investment schemes. And it was worth, you know, approaching $30 billion. Uh, but in Singapore, um, there was a whistleblower. I should actually say it was a whistleblower's mother. Um, so there was a lawyer inside Wirecard's Singapore Asian headquarters. And um, he had started to become suspicious. He had conducted an investigation into some members of Wirecard's own finance team, um, discovered that they were doing strange little frauds. They were doing things like backdating contracts or forging invoices, you know, for amounts, you know, 2 million euros here, 2 million euros there, which 
you know, work, that's a significant amount of money to just be sending out to the company. But in the context of a company with 2 billion euros in annual sales, you know, it's not too critical. And so he reported this up to head office in Munich. And that was the point at which the whole investigation was squashed and this lawyer was forced out. And his mother is this sort of incredible Sikh woman. Um, she raised him herself. She trained as a banker, had flown all around Asia, sort of, you know, taking him to business meetings when he was young because um, she was a single mother. And she wasn't going to let Wirecard get away with it. And so she got in touch with me and sent me an email saying, would I be interested in wrongdoing at a financial company? Um, because stories get stories. She had seen my previous work on Wirecard and thought I might be interested. And so as soon as um, the whistleblower found out about it, he was like, oh my God, Mark, what have you done? <laughs> but, because uh, he was busy looking for a new job, but he did the right thing. So I flew to Singapore and went to meet him. And so let's talk about how that process worked and what we had to do. So what he sent me first before I got on the plane was this document we're looking at here. And this was a report by an outside law firm on this investigation in Singapore. And, you know, I immediately knew it was the good stuff because it says legally privileged and strictly confidential. Do not make copies. Got to be something good in there. And what we had to do was think about, OK, who is this guy? What is his motivation? And what material, what material does he have? And how are we going to establish that? what he's telling us is the truth. Mm -hmm. We also had to be very careful. So uh, for two reasons, one is because Singapore is a known hacking threat just on the, from the government. Um, it's a very friendly pace for business, but is an authoritarian state. Um, and also we were very concerned at this point about Wirecard's hacking capabilities. Mm -hmm. So I went to Singapore with a burner phone, um, a cheap Chromebook um, with nothing on it in case I needed to use the internet. Actually, I was told, don't use the hotel Wi-Fi. Right. And also um, an air-gapped laptop with, um, so it had had its ability to connect to, to the internet removed um, as a security precaution, and it had software on there so I could sort of encrypt and hide any files that I was given. Mm -hmm. And so I went to meet him in, um, in a hotel lobby and he sort of started telling me and sort of sketching out all this amazing stuff about um, what was happening inside Wirecard. And I quite quickly realized he was the real deal um, in part because, you know, his level of knowledge was incredible. Um, you could tell he was angry and he was sort of open about what had happened to him and his motivations as well. He didn't seem to be trying to hide anything. I also have to say, if you bring your mother along to a meeting, it does wonders for your credibility. Um, she came along and had lunch with us. And so she was checking me out as well. And she was very concerned. She asked lots of questions. Would I protect her son? Mm -hmm. What would we do to protect his identity? And I sort of talked through the steps that we would take. And um, I think I sort of said, you know, if it's a choice between protecting your identity and publishing the story, then we just won't publish anything. Mm -hmm. And I spent. You, was that yeah. was that um, effective as a as a promise? I think so. I mean, I think it was a few things. It was, you know, I I think I earned Pav's trust. Mm -hmm. Um, his, his identity is in the book. He's made a documentary, by the way. Now I'm not betraying any confidences by naming him. Um, he, um. Yeah, so I, I think he sort of trusted me. He'd sort of seen that, you know, he understood what I was trying to do and was trying to expose at Wirecard. He was very concerned that a story be written. Mm -hmm. I think once he, you know, once he'd come to terms with being a whistleblower, he, he was very clearly determined to see it through. Mm -hmm. And he's a good lawyer. He was very organized in his thinking and the way he structured things. Um, he didn't try to over egg it. You know, particularly with some, with some short sellers, they will throw everything, every crackpot theory 
about his company, whereas he was, you know, he was very careful about what he did know and what he didn't know. And he also had the documents to back it up. So he had, in the Intel investigation, they had taken copies of three entire email inboxes of people who were suspected of being involved. And after sort of three days of meetings with him, he handed all of those over to me. So we encrypted it all, took it home. And, and then we sort of, you know, we stayed in con communication um, using Signal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what I did in the FT was I sort of set to work in a bunker, um, a room sort of inside the FT with no windows, uh, working on this air gap laptop. And uh, another precaution which we, and so all of the material went into um, a safe every night and and we um, and I also used a black and white laser printer, which doesn't um, leave micro dots on whatever it prints out. So what some people don't realize is that if you use a modern laser printer, uh, color one, most of them leave micro dots on what is printed, which sort of identify where and when whatever document was printed, which if you're dealing with sensitive material, you probably want to be wary of. Did you know how to take these precautions or did you have someone within the FT advising you? How did you know what steps to take? So we have a, uh, we have a dedicated cybersecurity team at the FT. So they were very helpful in, um, in sort of telling us what to do, how to approach it. Um, the sort of part of it was driven by legal risk as well. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of a combination of both yeah, advice from the technology team and also advice from our lawyer, Nigel Hansen. So when you're, because um, European data law is now very onerous and sort of data is the new front with which um, people like oligarchs and others are trying to sort of stop mm -hmm. stories getting written. So you have to be very careful with how you treat data. And because we had a lot of sort of, you know, top secret and sensitive internal data, we had to, show that we were taking care of it. So that's part of the reason it went in the safe. You know, we're being very careful with this uh, information. Okay, so you had this, this uh, body of uh, inside information, incredibly confidential and privileged. What happened next? So we got to the point where we're ready to write the story. And then something it, quite specific to UK law happened, which we we had been worried about libel. Could we prove it? And uh, so I worked with my colleague Stefania Palmer in Singapore on the stories. So we found another whistleblower. Um, she went and knocked on lots of doors and found that, you know, companies' names on invoices didn't really exist, that sort of thing. And so we got ready to publish, but just before we're about to publish, a new legal question comes up can we actually rely on this document in front of us? And it turns out those words legally privileged were quite important uh, because when we went to Wirecard for questions, what they could potentially do was rush to the UK courts and get an injunction, say this is breach of confidence. These are the most sensitive internal legal documents. You can't use them. Um, and so what we had to do was to um, find a way to write the story without using those magic words or you know without referring to this report so that we I, I wouldn't don't... tip our hand to wire card that's amazing how did you do that so what we did so Wirecard had um summer so one of its lawyers had summarized the findings from this report in a powerpoint presentation which had been sent to um the board in germany and because that didn't have those magic words legally privileged on it, we really, we could rely on that. And that sort of got us over that hurdle. And then so we published the stories and the reaction was quite strange. And this is where the whole story starts to really take off and get very quite unusual. Because um, what I kind of effectively said it was fake news. Or rather, a German investment bank wrote a piece saying it was fake news. And this is where my earlier mistake started to come back to haunt me. So Wirecard said, 
well, this is just the same old story. Dan McCrum's in league with market speculators. Uh, they accused us of leaking our story to people ahead before it was published so they could trade on it. And um, yeah, basically said we were corrupt and there was no truth to it whatsoever. And the kind of amazing thing was that sort of the German authorities believed them. So um, uh, the watchdog Baffin announced an investigation into me and Stefania Palmer, and then it announced that it would suspend short selling in Wirecard shares to protect the company and the German economy. And that was something that they had only ever done during the big 2008 financial crisis when they used that measure to protect the company, the country's banks. So that was, that was quite unusual. And I think it was because of the previous association with a short seller attack that, you know, that line of response seemed to work. So what we did is we were like, okay, well, we need to come up with something better, which is going to convince everyone that there's something seriously wrong here. And so this is when we moved before, beyond what the whistleblower had told us initially about the internal investigation to what we had just found in the pile of documents. And what we started to realize was at the heart of Wirecard's business was this setup where it relied on business partners, sort of friends who were responsible for huge amounts of the company's sales and profits. And there was something strange because they never seemed to pay them any money. I could see all these little emails of people saying, yeah, we keep chasing them and yeah, they just never pay us. Why, why don't we ever get paid by these guys? And sort of one of the, you know, the mysteries which people had told us about Wirecard's Asian business was that there never seemed to be any money. There was this mismatch between its public image of this very successful company and the inside when they're all constantly scrabbling around to try and find cash to pay for things. So what my colleague Stefania Palmer did was go and knock on the doors of some of these partners. And, um, you know, it's a pretty straightforward, basic bit of journalism. Go and knock on the door and see what's there. Mm -hmm. And what we found were a collection of smoking guns. Um, so one of them, which is pictured here, so this is one of Wirecard's key partners. It was called PayEasy and it was supposed to be a very large payment business. But when Stefania went to its office in Manila, she discovered it was shared with a tour bus company. And when she went inside, there were sort of tour bus drivers coming in and out and, you know, lots of stuff to do with that. But there wasn't obviously anyone involved in payment processing around. And so we kind of thought that this was the smoking gun. And, you know, we sort of, we, and by this point, we were starting to hear from more whistleblowers who were, um, adding to our conviction and sort of each new story prompted new people to get in touch and say, well, this is my experience of Wirecard. And we started to fit everything together and to realize that these partners were the most important part of Wirecard's business. It's where all the money came from and there was something strange about them. But let me just, uh, this is, you know, what you're describing is an incredibly stressful journalistic situation of being under serious attack. Um, can you just describe a little bit what that experience was like and whether you at any point feared that you would lose the support of your editors? So yeah, it did start to get quite stressful. Um, so I was constantly being attacked on Twitter, um, you know, that criminal McCrum. Um, it kind of you know, you start to think you're going a little bit crazy when um, the German authorities announce a full criminal investigation into you. Um, there's a very strange moment where I'm sort of watching some of my colleagues write a news story about how we're under investigation. And, and yeah, you start to think, well, I've done everything I can as a journalist. I'm publishing the stories and nobody seems to be listening and I don't understand why. And I think that was a lesson in, you know, the power of, you know, that fake news criticism. Um, and it really did start to become quite nerve wracking. And there's a moment as well, which um, I hadn't put it in the slides here because it's quite hard to sort of 
explain it. But we started to realize that um, that bad guy, Jan Marsalek, was connected to uh, Russian spies. And so um, sort of my editor, Paul Murphy, pulls me aside one day and says, yeah, I need to talk to you. There's a Russian element to this. Um, this guy, Jan Marsalek, has been flashing around top secret documents with a recipe for Novichok on them, the Russian nerve gas. And um, he's a total enigma because was he a spy? Was he not a spy? Um, was he, why would he do that just to try and impress people? Like, again, it, none of it makes any sense. But when you're sort of, you go, oh, hang on, the Russians are involved, they're quite nasty people, you do start to worry, you know, I wouldn't stand near the edge of a tube platform, for instance, just to be on the safe side. You start to take all sorts of precautions like that, and you do start to worry, well, it would be very convenient if, um, if I wasn't around anymore. So yes, that was quite a lot of pressure, but the you asked also about um, the backing from the Financial Times, and because of our experience with the company, and because we were very lucky, I think, to have Lionel Barber, the editor, right at the end of his tenure, um, when you know, he'd been in charge at the FT for 14 years. So we had his total confidence. He'd been through us with the story. So we never, we never really worried about you know, the FT's backing. Although, I mean, you know, I'd walk across the newsroom and people would shout things like, oh, so have you been arrested yet? Um, so yeah, I hope does that answer the question? That's uh... yeah, yeah, yes, it does. So uh, so what happened next? You were knocked on these doors. You found what you felt to be multiple smoking guns, uh, and then what happened? So um, oh yeah, so there were a whole sort of series of dirty tricks, and what we started to realize was at one point. Um, there were there was a team of 30 private detectives running around London trying to capture our sources, us talking to our sources, um, looking for evidence of you know sort of journalists colluding with speculators and short sellers. Um, and so we sort of had to be extra careful. Um, so so and, and again, once we realized the Russians were involved, so we would take precautions like um you know, we wouldn't have conversations about the story with our phones in the room. And, you know, if, our, if we were going to meet sources, I'd do all sorts of, you know, silly things like, um, you know, ducking into a tube station and then running out the other side um, to try and shake off any, you know, anyone who might be following me. Um, but what we also realized was that to, the stories weren't working for whatever reason, Wirecard, people seem to be giving Wirecard the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had, you know, the initial, that first story knocked, I think about 8 billion euros off Wirecard's stock market valuation. Mm -hmm. um, but it then secured the backing of um, a very famous technology investor called SoftBank, a big Japanese conglomerate. And so, and Ernst Young signed off on the accounts once again. So we kind of thought we're going to have to go back to the drawing board here. And then I actually got very lucky. Um, so even, even with all this sort of information and all these whistleblowers, sometimes you do need a little bit of luck. Mm -hmm. And what happened in this case was there was an American court proceeding against a payment processor called Allied Wallet. Um, it signed a settlement with the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, basically it had been helping process online payments for a whole bunch of scams. Um, it was things like, um, you know, fraudsters who would basically send people invoices or bills for things they hadn't bought and then threaten to sue them unless they paid up. And, and what we discovered is we realized Wirecard had been working with this company which had just been caught, Allied Wallet. But in Wirecard's books, it also said it was working with the partners. Mm -hmm. And so I went, I decided I'd write a story about this and I went and asked the Allied Wallet for comment. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, yes, we work with Wirecard, we'll admit to that, but we've never heard of this partner, 
We don't know who they are, what's going on. And that was kind of the aha moment. And so I went back to this big trove of documents and looked up and I started to look at other Wirecard customers, you know, in the same set. And it was like, hang on a second, that one had also gone bust. That one doesn't seem to exist. And that was like the key story. And there were about 35 of these customers. And the job was really, you know, they was to work out, okay, well, what company might they be? Because the names weren't completely clear. And then I had to get hold of someone like that company. And I think I spent about a month calling and emailing every possible company who it might be, trying to work out who they were, get someone on the phone to talk about it. How have they done business with Wirecard? Mm -hmm. Have they heard of this partner? And a pattern emerged. Um, you know, a section of them had simply gone out of business. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't have been doing this you know, they couldn't have been working with Wirecard. And then another section had said they had worked with Wirecard in the past, but had stopped. Or they had talked to Wirecard about maybe working with it, but nothing had ever happened. And so that became very clearly, okay, this is the heart of it. This is the fake business. And it was this sort of effort to, you know, double and triple check every single possibility. Have we got the evidence we have? And then what we did is we decided to do something different that we hadn't done with the previous stories, which was to publish the underlying documents. So we put together this story, um, which was published in October uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. And what it clearly laid out was, this is how Wirecard is committing the fraud. Mm -hmm. It's using these fake customers to hoodwink its auditors. The customers don't really exist. Here's all the evidence. We've contacted all of them and they say they've never heard of these partners it claims to do business with. And here are the documents. See for yourself that these are genuine. And I think that is sort of, you know, what really ultimately convinced people that um, the story was true. Uh, so let me ask you, you know, we are living in an era where the accusation of fake news abounds. Um, uh, you had, there were all kinds of accusations lodged against you. Um, what would you say is um, the difference in actually publishing documents? How does that break through? So what Wirecard had, what Wirecard had done was um, its explanations changed over time. So it, for a long time, it hid behind the complexity of its business. Right. So when I had written the original sets of stories, Wirecard's response was simply to say, you don't understand our business. It's all very complicated mm -hmm. and you don't get it. Mm -hmm. And then what they did once we started publishing the stories about the whistleblowers, um, to begin with, they said, well, the numbers are small. They're not material. Mm -hmm. And the mistake which a lot of people made was to look at the amounts which were admittedly small mm -hmm. rather than the practices. What on earth, why, why on earth were guys in Wirecard's finance team doing this sort of weird little fraud? And why weren't they fired? And as we wrote more and more stories, you know, we sort of went to the Philippines and published those. Wirecard couldn't really explain it all away by saying, it's complicated any, you know, it's all, it's too complicated or giving these sort of, you know, it would give us sort of three paragraphs of very dense explanation, which we'd sort of be forced to print and no one could really understand. But as we got closer to the truth, it couldn't really say that anymore. And so it switched tack to saying, these documents you're relying on aren't real. Someone's trying to play you here you know, they've given you false evidence. And so once we sort of got them to that point, that was sort of kind of the last leg they were standing on. And we realized we could sort of knock that out by publishing the documents and what people would be able to look at them. And sort of one of them was, you know, was a spreadsheet with, or, you know, it was a collection of hundreds of spreadsheets all in one file with loads of different information and things. Mm. And when you just looked at it, you could tell they were authentic. It, you mm. know, it, 
it would have been sort of in, incredibly difficult to have faked that. And what we did is we sort of also, in addition to, you know, the main simple story, we also published, you know, a thing, a sort of a guide through the documents, walking people through how they all fit together and how one supported the other. And I think that sort of evidence just became overwhelming. You couldn't just say, no, this is fake. So we're about to open it up to questions, and I see that a number have been coming through. But um, Dan, so tell us, what was the impact of this story? So <coughs> what I think it, it, it did a number of things. One was it sort of it restored the reputation of the Financial Times, mm -hmm. because um, there was a moment when sort of halfway through, it gets a little bit convoluted, but I won't go into it now. But the, sort of the, the noise around the story and Wirecard and this battle with the FT became so loud that the FT felt it had to announce its own internal investigation. Um, so it hired some external lawyers to come in and investigate me and my mm -hmm. uh, boss, Paul Murphy. And they did that because, as Lionel Wilder said, the reputation of the FT was at stake. Mm -hmm. And so I think the impact of that has been both you know, it's been tremendous for the FT's reputation externally. I mean, that happens when you have a great story. Um, I think it's also helped encourage a sort of a culture of investigation. And you can certainly see, you know, Wirecard is not the FT's only great success recently. We've had a whole string of stories, I think, sort of exposing Green Cell and uh, the former Prime Minister David Cameron's involvement in that, you know, is another sort of award-winning set of stories, um, along with lots of other great scoops. So internally, that's been the effect. I think that's been great for the reputation. Um, the impact was, you know, people are looking for frauds again. I um, mean, financial markets broadly, there's sort of been a rising tide for a very long time. Anything which has sort of, you know, a whiff of technology, you know, sort of a bit like fairy dust. Technology, ooh, it's very valuable. So mm -hmm. I think it's prompted people to take a harder look at a lot of different tech companies and their com claims. And as I mentioned at the start, it's sort of, I think it's prompted a lot of soul searching sort of within Germany and particularly its financial community about, well, how on earth did this happen? And what did we miss? All right, um, I'm going to, I know you have a few more slides, but I'd like to open it up to some questions at this point. Um, could we have a, could we have a first question, please? Thanks, Catherine, and thanks, Dan. That's really, really interesting and kind of, I think it would be a brilliant Netflix documentary, actually. <laughs> well, speaking of that, uh, just wait for the autumn and... Uh, really? Yes. <laughs> brilliant. Well, we've had loads of questions, um, but kind of to go back to the start, a question that we've had a couple of times is um, about short sellers and what you kind of need to consider when you're using them as sources, um, since obviously they kind of have a bit of a vested interest in um, companies failing and stuff. Um, so, you know, what do you need to consider and where can journalists find short sellers to speak to? Um, so short sellers have a vested interest, so be aware of their motivations. Um, I guess it's like any source, you know, you have good sources and you have flakier sources. So are they trying to sell you on everything about this company is terrible and every single thing? Or do they have, you know, what, what was very clear about, you know, so the guy, uh, it's a guy called Leo Perry was one, sort of the key first short seller. And he would always sort of, when I spoke to him, he would always sort of catch himself. He was very careful. You know, he would go, it looks like fraud, but you know, maybe there is another explanation. I just haven't seen it, you know. How are they presenting themselves? And you could sort of see, do they have the evidence? You know, is this just a theory? What have they found to advance it? What sort of work have they done? Um, do they understand it themselves? One of the interesting things of the book is the is not the person you're talking to may not necessarily be the person who has done the work. Um, and, and I think, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's like any old bit of journalism, you need multiple sources, you need to test the evidence. Yeah, and kind of on that, obviously, you had whistleblowers, but um, 
did you use any like open source databases or were there any other kind of you know useful things in your investigation that you would recommend for other journalists yes great question so um there are i used a lot of corporate databases so in the uk in germany and singapore in particular um, you have sort of companies house and the federal register i think it's called accra in singapore and there you can look up any company and you can get corporate records for free or for you have to pay a small amount um, so those were very useful um, the internet archive i used a lot um, it's also known as the Wayback Machine. Mm. And, you know, it, it doesn't have everything, but that is very useful for when you're looking at companies which seem suspicious. And so what you could see is, um, in some cases, Wirecard would announce that it was buying a company and you'd say, wow, this doesn't seem as good as they're making out. And you could see that just before Wirecard bought it, it would get like a glitzy new website, which completely changed the nature of its business. And you could go, oh, hang on a second. No, it used, you know, there's one which this used to be like a tourism website. And now suddenly it's a payments company. So the Internet Archive was um, very useful. And I'm sure there's another one, but it's um, it momentarily escapes me. All right. Uh, uh, next question. Um... So another question we have is um, obviously you shared some really great tips about, um, you know, dealing with corporate entities. Um, but do you have any other tips about kind of dealing with corporate secrecy or a lack of transparency? Um, I mean, obviously, they went for you pretty hard. So <laughs> I guess you have some good tips to share. Um, yeah, so I think. I think one of the. I mean, one of the things is really basic when you're dealing with companies is they should be able to explain their own business. And so you, this was one of the great lessons from the uh, 2008 financial crisis when you had lots of complicated financial instruments, which is ultimately, if you keep asking enough questions, you should be able to understand something. And so you kind of have to keep going until you get a good answer. And certainly in the early days when I was trying to understand Wirecard's business, they would sort of give one explanation and then say, well, that doesn't make sense. And then it would shift and they would give a different explanation. And you're kind of like, aha, I think we're onto something here. Well, let me just ask a question about this, which is, Dan, what was your understanding of what the purpose of the scheme, uh, the sort of you know, basics of how the scheme worked and what the purpose of the scheme was? So I think the fraud almost started by accident. What you see with a lot of frauds is they don't go, I mean, you, actually, okay, you do see this sometimes with frauds, but they don't, they don't typically go, let's do a massive accounting fraud. What they do is they say, oh, we've run into a problem. We need to make this quarter's numbers or this year's numbers, and we can't. So we'll cheat a little bit and then we'll make it up. But of course, you can never catch up and the cheating becomes larger and larger until it takes over. And at that point, I think the point was, well, the chief executive, Marcus Brown, was the largest shareholder and his stake became, you know, he became a billionaire based on the value of his shares, which he then borrowed money against. So he was sort of taking money off the table that way. And then they simply stole a lot of money. So the Wirecard raised um, about 4 billion euros from, its, from investors. And most of that money was either went to prop up the business, which was in reality losing money. And also they stole it through things like uh, loans to their friends. Uh, next question, Emily. So another question that we have is, um, obviously this is, super intense, something that you've been doing for a very long time. Um, so someone said, uh, as a human question, how did you kind of deal with the pressure of that? And also, when you were um, working on the story, was it like you were only focusing on the wire card investigation? Um, or were you doing other stuff? Like, was it a very full on 
you know. <laughs> um, so, oh yes, yeah, so there's a couple of different bits there. So the stress, um, I mean, I talk about in the book, uh, there's a lot of my life in there and sort of my wife, Charlotte, was amazing throughout all of it um, and was very supportive. And, um, and it's sort of, when you condense it all together, into you know into one quick sort of hour of the story um you sort of you miss the fact that it, it was this sort of slow steady escalation over a period of years so there were moments of intense stress um but for most of it i was just sort of doing my normal job and wire cards was just one story among many um and it was only really once the whistleblower got in touch towards the end of 2018 where i I sort of dropped everything else and just focused entirely on Wirecard. And so that last year and a half was quite intense. Great, thank you. Um, and kind of a general question, um, do you get the sense that there are other frauds kind of similar to Wirecard going on around the world? And if so, where do you think that journalists should start digging? Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's other frauds out there. I think I've got some other stories uh, to write. Um, uh, there's huge fraud in crypto at the moment. And, uh, you know, and companies just not being held to account made to say, OK, so you have tens of billions of assets. Where are they? Um, so, you know, that's one place to start. Um, you can look for... Uh, like financial indicators. So, you know, I mean, I could talk about specific things. It's for instance, um, there's something called trade receivables. Are they going faster than sales? That's one thing which short sellers look for. But really, you know, as a journalist, your job isn't, or what I see as the job of the journalist is not to become a super expert on numbers and things. You know, if that happens as a byproduct, then great. But really what you need are people. So go find the experts who look for these things and, you know, get to know them, get to speak the language they speak, find, you know, the good sources and then the stories come that way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I see one question that I that I'm always keenly interested in that I want to raise, which is how did you you're obviously amassing a huge amount of information. Uh, can you talk about how you organized or kept track of that? So I'm laughing because I had just remembered the one tip, which um, I always mean to say, which is uh, really basic, but um, put the date on your notebooks. As someone who has just attempted to turn six years of reporting into a book, I really wish I had put the date next to every single note I had taken in a notebook and had written in large letters dates and contents on the cop on the uh, on the front of my notebooks. So please do that. You will make life a lot easier for yourself if you find yourself in my situation. And um, I don't. In, te in terms of organization, it's. Yeah, I tend to I tend to work on the I have a pile of stuff and I know something is in there, so I can find it if I have to um, approach. But uh, you know, you can write entire books about um, the most efficient way to do that. So I think we maybe only have time for one more question. Um, obviously, you dealt with a couple of whistleblowers. Um, but apart from obviously writing stories about Wirecard, is there any other particular ways to encourage more people to come and uh, speak to you or leak information to you? Um, well, I mean, it's kind of like, I think, write good stories. You know, stories get stories. People will get in touch if they know you're interested in the subjects, if, you know, you have written other stories, but I mean, it's also a question of, you know, I mean, Paul Murphy talked about this. Every person you meet is a potential source, not right in that moment, but, you know, years later, occasionally you'll find that someone you spoke to, they have a story and they're like, oh, I should talk to a journalist about. Have I ever met a journalist? Oh yeah, there's that guy. So, I mean, but 
you know, I feel like, I mean, I'm talking to Jonas, I'm telling you how to suck eggs at this point. So I don't think I can <laughs> really, really um, add much more on that. Um, Dan, as we are getting close to the end of this, could you put up your final slide, oh, yes. please, which has your contact information? Um, uh, and yeah, there was this one, which has, uh, I've got a website, which is, I should have put this on danmacrum.com, which has links to a lot of the key FT uh, stories. Uh, I think a lot of them are free as well. They were um, sort of, they're, they're, they sit outside the FT's paywall, so you can um, read most of them, I think. And here are my contact details. I am at FD at Twitter. Um, drop me a line if you want to say hello. And uh, especially if you see this guy, this is the mystery man who, when Wirecard collapsed, he disappeared on a private plane to Be Belarus and hasn't been seen since. Very, very interesting. So, uh, and, and is there a reward out for him? Um, a general acclamation. I mean, that would be one hell of a story. Um, and I don't know if the German police have a reward out for him, actually. But uh, he's believed to be in Moscow, um, is the best information that I have at the moment. Fascinating. Well, um, we are almost out of time. I wanted to let everybody know um, for your diaries that there will be another GIJN webinar on July 5th at 9 a.m. Eastern time. It will be an advanced Google workshop with open source reporting guru uh, Hank Van S. I will definitely be signing up for that. GIJN will be announcing the event today. So make sure you uh, check their website follow them on Twitter, um, and uh, uh, Twitter. Uh, the Twitter feed is at G-I-J-N. And uh, I would really like to thank Dan for uh, shedding light on this extraordinary, perhaps once in a lifetime investigation. I don't know if you could live through another one of these. <laughs> um, thanks to G-I-J-N for inviting me to host. Um, and thank you all for your kind attention to this uh, remarkable story. So uh, thank you all and goodbye. Thank you as well. <laughs>